Good morning, my name is DJ and I'm an intern here at Highland Heights. I wanted to take a minute to welcome you and give you a quick overview of some upcoming events. But first, if you're visiting for the first time, scan the QR code on the Connect card in front of you and we will get to know you a little bit better. This will get you more information on who we are and how you can get involved. Don't forget to drop off your baby bottles in the main lobby. We will be collecting those for the Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center until February 25th. Next week, we will be having Jersey Sunday, where your favorite team jersey from any sport, even pickleball. We can't wait to see the variety of teams that will be represented as we are reminded that God has brought us together to be one team for his purpose. In the month of February, we will be having four Moms to Mom events. These are for mothers with children up to five years old. Find our group in the app for more details. Our February play date will take place in the gym from 9.30 to 11.30 on President's Day while the kids are off of school. This is a great opportunity to come and check out our group and meet other moms with young kids. Last but certainly not least, a shout out to February's Ministry of the Month, our senior adults. Thank you guys for all that you do to serve the body well. Thanks so much for joining us in worship today. Let's prepare our hearts for worship and lift our voices up in song. Good morning, church. How we doing? Hey, I'm not going to lie. I am excited to be back. I've loved my time off, but I'm glad to be back with y'all, church. Hey, let's celebrate the Lord this morning and what he's doing. What do you say? Come on, let's stand up. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us.
his. Amen. As we approach our time of prayer, some of you may want to make your way down to this front area of the steps to voice your concerns to the Lord. You can certainly all pray where you're seated. In a crowd our size, in the church our size, we could name dozens, maybe hundreds of people, brothers and sisters in our church family, or somehow connected with our church family that 
we ought to pray for. We can't name them all, but I want to share a couple of names for you to keep in prayer. Uh, many of you know Ray and Brenda Freeman, both of whom have a number of medical issues they've been dealing with really for several years now. Carolyn Hall, been in rehab for many months, having a rough time. You can pray for her and her husband, Carlton. We all learned about Lynn and Erica Mabe and the recent passing of their son, Joe. I also want to direct your thinking in praying for yourself uh, with some scriptures uh, that God can use to encourage you. Our pastor, Josh, has been preaching a series of sermons called Sailing at Night, Following Christ in Difficult Seasons. And last week, he shared a couple of verses from the book of James I'd like to read again. Uh, we can try to apply those to ourselves. James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. A trial can be a test that God allows. It's interesting that in the original language, the same word that is translated as trial here in James is translated as temptation in 1 Corinthians, where Paul was writing about times when Christians are tempted to sin. And Paul writes, no temptation. We could substitute trial. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Temptation, trial, like two sides of one coin. Satan wants to use our difficult seasons in life to tempt us to rebel against God, to go our own way, do what seems right in our own eyes. Well, God wants to take that same situation that he has allowed to come into our lives as a trial or as a test, and he's really wanting us to pass that test. God wants us to succeed in these difficult times in our lives. But we might say, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what direction to take. I need some wisdom. I need some help from God. Well, I'll tell you, when we call out to God for his wisdom, he does not say something like this. Butch McCarthy, you've been saved over 61 years. You ought to have this figured out by now. I'm not going to tell you anything again I've already taught you. I'm not going to give you anything new. You need to you start doing what I told you to do 50 years ago. You haven't got it down yet, do you? No, he doesn't approach us like that. James gives us a great promise. A few verses later in James 1, verse 5, he says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. He's not going to berate us for not having the wisdom to figure it out, to know what direction to take. He will generously give us his wisdom in large amounts. Listen to that same verse from the Amplified Bible. If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly, without reproaching or fault-finding, and it will be given to him. The song we just sang said, the battle is God's. He will give us wisdom to take the steps we need to take, but it's his battle. And another song we're going to be singing in a few minutes we want to call on the name of Jesus. In his name, you call out to God for wisdom. And in his way and in his time, he's going to give you the wisdom you need. I'm going to open our time of prayer, give you just a few seconds of silence so you don't have to be listening to me. Well, you can voice your thoughts to the Lord, and then I'll close our prayer time. Let's go to him in prayer now. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father. We thank you for your incredible love for us that you would send Jesus to be our Savior and open up for us the possibility of coming to you in prayer at any time, under any circumstances. We thank you that you're always willing to hear your children. As your children pray now, respond in, according to your plans and your good purposes for them and for the people for whom they're praying and specifically for themselves in the season of difficulty that they may be facing in this moment.
Heavenly Father, for those that are sick, we ask for your healing touch, working through the medical professionals and also with your own direct unseen hand to bring about healing. For those that are facing trials and dealing with any kind of difficult season in life, Lord, give them your wisdom. And as they call out to you for your wisdom and your guidance and strength and help, Lord, demonstrate that in their moment of need, your grace is sufficient, moment by moment. And as they look to you and call out to you and cry out to you for your ministry in their lives and for your help in solving difficult situations, in the midst of what may be seemingly like outward chaos, deep inside their minds and hearts, give them the peace that only the Lord Jesus Christ can give. And Father, as our pastor continues this series of sermons about dealing with the hardships and difficulties of life, I ask you to fill him with your spirit and preach your word through him with your power and your authority and with your love and your compassion. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done in our lives and in the life of this, this church. And we trust you to keep on doing what you know is good, right, and best for every individual and for the church body as a whole. We thank you for it all in the strong and powerful, precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, will you do this with me this morning? Just say the name Jesus. Say it again. Whew. I don't know about you, but I don't even need him to say, yes, I'm here. I just know he is. And just the mention of his name can bring peace, can bring a smile. Because I know what he's done. I know he's faithful. He's always been faithful. And when I call on the name of Jesus, he is faithful to listen and hear. So this morning as we sing this song, as we speak the name Jesus, I encourage you, if you need to come forward, the altar's not closed. You can come forward. You can do business right where you're at in the seat. But if you just need to cry out this morning and speak the name Jesus over whatever it is going on in your life, man, maybe you're on the mountaintop. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're in the valley. Jesus. Whatever it is this morning, just speak the name Jesus. He offers peace and comfort in whatever situation and season of life you're in.
that we even get to speak the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, would you forgive us where we failed you, Lord? God, would you bring healing to this place, Lord? We love you. God, we know that you are here. We can feel your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we just ask you to change us. Lord, may our eyes and our hearts and our minds be receptive for what you have for us today. God, would you speak through Pastor Josh? Lord, would you give him your power and your strength as he brings our message today, Lord? We love you. We praise you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
And where to start, where to start, where to start. I got to tell you, I have, uh, it's been an interesting sermon series because like I kind of mentioned it last week, we don't, we don't talk about suffering and, and wandering through those dark seasons maybe uh, enough as a, a church and, and church family and just church tradition in America where we are. And, and, and I got to be honest, like I, I just really have enjoyed how the Lord has been speaking and moving um, in my life and in our church family throughout the, the sermon series as we've been talking about sailing at night when we can't see what is in front of us, learning to look up and trusting that the Lord will continue to guide our steps as we continue to walk by faith and not by sight. And, and we know these scriptures, we know that God is in control and it's easier to believe those things when we're in the good times, then we're in the bad times. Is that just, is that just me? Y'all feel like that too? Like it's easier to trust that God is in control in the good times than when we're walking through uh, those, those difficult and, and sometimes just if we're going to be cards on the table, like just completely dark seasons of life that sometimes come our way. And so this morning I was I was really bringing in a conclusion to our, our series, Sailing at Night, and I, I've just uh, entitled it Sovereignty and Suffering and the Mission of God. Because throughout this series, we've been talking about God's purpose behind our pain. We've been talking about what it means to walk with Him by faith and to allow Him to use even those dark nights of the soul, as Billy Graham called them, and use those painful moments in our lives to make us more like the Savior, help us to minister to the brothers and sisters. And this morning, I, I want you to see so desperately how God wants to use even those dark nights, those dark seasons in our lives to advance his gospel, perhaps in ways you might not have considered before. And so if you have your Bibles, and I, I hope you do, because we're going to do some Bible study this morning, we are going to begin with what is perhaps uh, everybody's least favorite book of the Bible, and that's the book of Job. Like, first off, is Job anyone's favorite book? Or like, just like, I don't see that hand. There we go. <laughs> like, it's tough to read the book of Job at times. Most of the time. A couple years ago, I was doing Bible recap. It's a chronological Bible plan where you're reading through the Bible uh, throughout the year. And, and this year, my family and I were doing a, a different study where we're focusing on digging into the New Testament. But those few years ago, when we were doing the Bible recap, one of the things that hits you is by the time you're at like day five, you're in Job. And it's a long January from then on out, all right? Anybody doing Bible recap? Bless you. Bless you. Keep going. It's worth it on the other side. Because Job, although it's in the middle of the scriptures, is very early in Jewish tradition. Written very early on between uh, the time where you have Noah, about 400 years after Noah, and before the call of Abraham. So very, very early in Israel's history do we have the book of Job. And Job opens up where you have this guy who is to be completely admired. Like he has his stuff together in ways that I don't. Y'all feel that? And things are going particularly good for him. And then verse 6 happens. So let's just read these couple of verses, this interaction that Job got no say in, by the way. And this is what it says. It so says, so one day the sons of God, like the angels of the Lord, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan, who, if you know Bible history, was an angel, fallen angel, led people to re or angels to rebel against God, also comes before the Lord with them. 
And the Lord asks Satan, where did you come from? Now, here's the thing. God didn't need Satan's answer. He knew what Satan had been doing. He knew where Satan had been. He knew what Satan was wanting. And this is Satan's response. I was roaming through the earth and walking around on it. We'll get to some New Testament connections there in just a minute. And in verse 8, without Satan asking, God just goes right in. And the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Remember, he knows where Satan had been. He knew what Satan was doing. He knew what Satan was wanting. And without Satan even really fully asking the question, God says, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one else on earth who is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. And Satan answers the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him? His household and everything he owns, you have blessed the works of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hands and strike everything he owns and he will surely curse you to your face. And God says to Satan, very well. Everything he owns is in your power. His family, his health, his possessions, all yours. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And what we find in the book of Job is Satan wastes no time in getting right to work. There are some things that happen that ought to radically shift our view of suffering in this passage right here. We need to understand what is happening biblically because the Bible has this text that we might understand how God might be using hardships in our lives still today for his glory and for his good purposes. And the first thing that stands out to me is simply this, when we're considering the suffering, suffering and the sovereignty of God, it's this, that no trial we face, no trial we have ever faced, no trial in which we currently face, and no trial which we will ever face. No trial, no temptation, no tribulation can come our way without first being sifted through the sovereign hands of God. That God is in complete control is undeniable biblical fact. And that he allows suffering for his purposes, though hard to hear, is also very true. We take a closer look at verses 7 and 8. And Satan answering God, he says, from roaming through the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth has a man like him, perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. And we need to ask ourselves what exactly is going on in this passage as we wrestle with uh, not just Job's suffering in abstract, but, but our suffering in concrete. 
The first thing we hear is Satan's response to God and our minds as believers, as students of God's word should jump to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. Listen to this passage that the apostle Peter writes to the early church. He says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God. God's hand is mighty. He is in control so that he might exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him. Though God's hand is mighty, though he is in control, you have concerns and suffering that is going on in your life. But those sufferings, those concerns do not invalidate that God cares for you. Listen, you can cast all your cares upon God because... He finishes that up in verse 7, because God cares about you. And then Peter advances the conversation for how the believer can walk through seasons of suffering, where he says, be sober-minded and alert. In other words, that we ought to wake up and pay attention because there's something in the midst of our pain that God has for us. Not only that something that God has for us, but there is an enemy that is working against us. Then he says, your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for the one he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that, at the, same, that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. God is mighty. He is in control. We go through seasons of trial and tribulation, of suffering and pain, and they do not diminish God's goodness or his control. We must be alert because God has something to show us and there is an enemy at work against him or against us and him. So we resist Satan, stay firm in the faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world, that this is normal. So what is Satan doing in Job as he's going to and fro? He wasn't out for a stroll. Don't miss this. God knows what he's up to. Satan wasn't just enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the day. You know what? I think I'll go see God. Hey, what are you doing, Satan? Satan. I was taking a stroll. The sun was nice. Thought I'd take a walk. Not what's going on. Says the devil, our adversary, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for the one that he can devour. He's not simply taking a stroll going to and fro. He was looking for someone to attack and to destroy. I don't need to have false assumptions about Satan's objective, specifically in our lives as followers of Jesus. He desires to bring us and our testimony to ruin. And so God looks at Satan. He says, hey, what are you doing? And he goes, hey, I was walking to and fro on the earth. And God knew that what he was really saying is I was looking for the person whom I would attack. John 10.10, it's one of my favorite verses. The first part of it isn't very good, but it ends amazingly well for us as followers of Jesus. It says, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And here's the thing that we're trying to wrap our minds around as we're thinking about the theology of suffering and, and trying to look at it from a biblical perspective and also apply these truths to our lives is that The abundant life that God is talking about in John 10.10 does not preclude suffering as followers of Jesus. And that blows our minds if we're just being perfectly honest. It's really hard for us to wrap our minds around that at times. And so here is what I firmly believe that Jesus is referring to when he's talking about the abundant life in Christ. It's first and foremost that we as followers of Jesus are no longer separated from God, but we have communion with God. And the abundant life starts with being right with God. Number two, the abundant life is a life that is filled with the Spirit, meaning that in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of a broken world, God has given his, us His Spirit that we might have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, even in seasons of pain. And number three, the abundant life is the eternal promise 
It is everlasting life and complete healing from the devastation of our brokenness of sin when we pass from this world and into the next. And so Satan, prowling around, and God sees Satan exactly for who he is, and we must as well. The second thing I want you to see in this passage in Job, and I want you to hear it again, this is what God says in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one else on the earth who is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan did not ask about Job. And here's what I know to be abundantly true. That if Satan goes before God today, God goes, what's up? Satan says, walking around. And then God might say, have you considered Josh? Like those are not the words that I want to come out of God's mouth. Just being completely real. But that is exactly what happens for Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Check this out. God is omnipresent. While Satan was walking around to and fro, one place at the time, God is omnipresent. He knew exactly what Satan was doing. He knew exactly what Job was doing. He's everywhere all at once. Not only that, but God is completely omnipotent. Satan had to get God's permission in order to attack Job because God had provided that hedge of protection around Job for a season. He could do nothing that God did not allow. Yet God is all-powerful, always in control. He's omnipotent. And God is omniscient, means that he is completely all-knowing. Which means he knew exactly what was getting ready to happen. Did you ever consider that? Job's suffering did not surprise God. He knew everything that he was getting ready to go through. He knew his family would die, his wife would run, his friends would reject him, his health would fade, his crops would be destroyed, and he allowed it anyway. So God allows Job's suffering. He basically sets Job on the tee for Satan to take his driver out and simply crush him into oblivion. And we need to ask this simple question, why? We like that question, don't we? Why? And I want to be perfectly honest with you. I don't have the specific reason for the specific suffering you are going through. And yet I do think the Bible gives us insights into the why and God's purpose in our suffering. And here's the thing. Job is 42 chapters long. So we can sit here for four or five hours or I can just kind of give you um, a little bit of a summary. Are y'all okay with that? Nobody said, I'm just saying, Tim. I'm going to give you a shorter story in Scripture. Check this out. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. It says this, As he, Jesus, was passing, he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Thousands of years have passed since Job was written, and yet the Jewish people still didn't understand how God used suffering in their lives. Remember, Job was written very early on, chronologically speaking, between the flood and Abraham. Thousands of years passed, and they still don't get it. I'm going to go ahead and say this. Thousands of more years passed, and maybe we still don't get it as well. And Jesus responds to his disciples. He says this in verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. It wasn't their sin that caused his suffering. Certainly sometimes we can sin and bring about suffering upon ourselves. But in this case, the sin didn't exist. It wasn't that his parents sinned and God was punishing him. It wasn't that he had sinned and, or was going to sin in a particular way, and so God was preemptively punishing him. Remember, he was blind from birth. And so Jesus simply answers, this came about so that God's work might be displayed in him. 
and God heals him and restores his sight. See, God in his divine providence and sovereignty allows suffering in our lives for his glory and our good. That his goodness and glory would be shown in us and through us to a watching world. I believe that's the way he always does it. We look at the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1. I want you to continue to dig into this word with me this morning. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul's writing this letter from prison. And in verse 12, this is what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Philippi. He says, now I want you to know. Those are words that ought to perk up our ears that Paul is getting ready to lay down truth for the church that is in Philippi. Paul is getting ready to explain so that they don't miss it to the church in Philippi. And I'm going to go ahead and say, I think Paul is still trying to bring a word to the church throughout the ages. This is God's word, and it is profitable for us today. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. Paul, you can't go and encourage the churches in person. Yeah, I know. But me going to prison advanced the gospel. Paul, you can't go preach in the streets. Yeah, I know. But me being in prison has advanced the gospel. What a radical way of thinking about trial and suffering that we might be going through. He says, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. In other words, guards were coming up to the prison cell, dropping off food, and Paul was sharing Jesus with them. It's become known through the whole imperial guard and to everyone else because then they were taking it home and sharing Jesus with their families. And not only that, but other people who knew about Paul's imprisonment were then going and sharing Jesus all the more. It has become known through the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. And most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. But what does it matter? Even the people that are against me, Paul says, I don't care because the gospel is going forth. He says only that in every way, whether false motives are true, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice because I know that this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and fill it unchurch. To die is gain. I want you to see that maybe what you're going through, God has planned from the start that you would be molded more into Christ likeness, as we have talked about over the past couple of weeks, that you would be more greatly able to minister to the brothers and sisters with great compassion because you understand. But not only that, but that you would be a sharper tool for the gospel advancement that God has called us to as followers of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing that I firmly believe, and as I read scripture, even this past week, I even more firmly believe today as I stand before you than I did when I start, is that trials face, that trials we face can propel the gospel forward in ways that we would not be able to before the trials happened. 
John Piper said this, afflictions are not merely the results of missionary fruitfulness. They are also the means. Did you catch that? Afflictions aren't just what happen because there is fruitful ministry. Afflictions are the means which bring about fruitful ministry. Would we consider our suffering like that? C.S. Lewis, in one of my favorite quotes that's a little bit longer, so hang on, says this. The human spirit will not even begin to try to surrender self-will as long as all seems to be well with it. We will not give up control to God, he says, as long as things are going well with us. Now, air and sin both have this property that the deeper they are, the less their victims suspect their existence and they are masked by evil. In other words, the deeper we are in sin, the less we see our own brokenness. But pain is unmasked. Unmistakable evil. Every man knows that something is wrong when he is being hurt. And pain is not only immediately recognizable evil, but evil impossible to ignore. We can rest contently in our sins and in our stupidities. And anyone who has watched Glutton shovel down the most exquisite foods as if they did not know what they were eating will admit that we can ignore even pleasure. But pain insists upon being attended to. Anybody who has ever kicked the corner of their couch with their pinky toes understands this. He says, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I want you to hear how your suffering can be used for the gospel and for God's glory. See, a broken world is not looking to those who they perceive as perfect. As a matter of fact, those whom act like they have it all together, our broken world knows that for them it's unobtainable. And not only for themselves, but also for you. And so as you go around looking perfect to the outside world, what the world sees is hypocrites. But true brokenness. People who have walked through deep hurt in their lives. Broken people who know that they are broken. They look to those who have walked through similar brokenness. Those who are still following Jesus faithfully. Those who are holding on to hope as God holds on to them. And our broken world desires what they have. Broken people need broken people to point them to the one who can heal our brokenness. And so in our suffering, our suffering breaks us. And in our suffering, others see Christ through us. I don't want you to miss it. The gospel can advance through your pain. Perhaps in ways that it can never do before. Paul also says that the trials that, were, that he was facing emboldened other believers. He said most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from his imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. And we can say it this way, time fails us. The clock is ticking. We do not have time to talk about all those who have suffered well for the cause of Christ. We could talk about Adoniram Judson or William Carey or George Lyle or Jim Elliott or Nate Saint or the countless others. But let me simply share a few. I'll share with you this letter from Adoniram Judson before he went to the mission field. This is a letter that he wrote to his future father-in-law. 
right? What a way to ask for a hand of marriage. Listen to this. He says, before leaving for the mission field, let me actually just skip right to it. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climates of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Are you a father of a girl? Because I'm not. But you fathers of girls, can you imagine being asked, can I marry your daughter? Can she come with me and die? And you, with joy, going, sure? He says, can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and for the glory of God, can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamation and praise which shall resound to her Savior from the heathens who are saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. The reality is, is Adoniram Judson's wife would go on to die on the mission field. And his second wife would go on to die on the mission field. And his third wife would also go on to die on the mission field. And Adoniram Judson would die as well. But through his life and testimony, countless faithful followers of Jesus were emboldened as the first American sent missionary, or one of the first American sent missionaries, George Lyle actually was the first. Thousands of others would walk in his footsteps. And multi-thousands of people would come to faith in Christ. Would he do it all again? I'm going to tell you from the way he wrote the letter, his answer would be yes. I'll accept all the sufferings again. Perhaps a more modern and familiar story is the story of Jim Elliott and Pete Fleming and Ed McCauley and Nate Saint and Roger uh, Yoderin. And I was listening to Steve Saint, the son of Nate Saint, uh, speak. Um, actually, one of uh, the, I won't even call it a sermon, but just talk that he gave at a conference a number of years ago as I was preparing for the message. And he talked about what happened to his father, Nate, and to the other four missionaries that were going down to Ecuador to reach a tribal people who were known for their violence. As a matter of fact, Steve would say that before the gospel arrived in this particular part and this particular people group in the midst of Ecuador, that 60% of the population would be murdered. Not like one time, like that was just like the trend continually because of how violent this tribe was. And so these five missionaries, if you know the story, they were dropping off gifts. They finally landed on a beach. They had a really good Friday, met a couple of the natives, showed back up on Saturday, and were all speared to death, violently, horrifically, thrown into the river to be seen no more. Only Steve's aunt Nate's sister, Rachel, and Jim's wife, Elizabeth, 
so broken, not for the loss of their husband and brother, but for the salvation of the tribe, return back to the people that killed their family and saw many come to faith in Christ. Some asked Steve Saint, Nate's son, years later, you know, your dad could have defended himself. As a matter of fact, I believe the history books show that they had guns with them. Last I checked, guns beat spears. And yet they willingly sacrificed their lives because they knew if they fired back, the tribe would never be reached with the gospel. He said, is it worth it? Would you change it? I'd do it all over again. He said, Josh, I'm not going to be a missionary. How does God use my suffering in America today? Before coming to Highland Heights, I pastored a church in Cincinnati had a couple of guys that uh, absolutely dearly loved, one by the name of Al Adams, one by the name of Alejandro Camacho. And um, Al had actually been diagnosed with cancer um, two times, told he had six months to live. Uh, both times, God healed him of the cancer. And he remembered at the time uh, one of his mentors simply saying to Al, Al, God will either be glorified by you in your life or he will be glorified by you in your death. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Years later, Alejandro, Alex, uh, would also get cancer. And though he was given only four months to live, God gave him close to four years to live. And Al did speak those words to him that had been spoken over him Years before, Alex, God will either be glorified by your life or he will be glorified by your death. And Alex's next four years were painful. They were brutal. But here's what happened. Alex, who was an amazing believer, he was a professor at a Christian college just a little ways away called Cedarville, would go on and win more people to Christ in his last four years than he had in the previous 50. And I believe God was glorified by it. See, I believe firmly this, that God desires to use your trials, your tribulation, your suffering and your pain that people would look at you and see the abundance of your faith and want what you have. And in the midst of that, if that's not enough, I want to remind you that in the end, the trials that we face are worth it. They're worth it. They're worth it for Jesus. In Revelation chapter 5, John, taken up into heaven, says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David who has conquered, he can open the scroll and its seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw the lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp 
and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. In chapter 6, the seals are opened. And in chapter 7, John continues to write, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and all peoples and all languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, they said, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around them, the elders and the four living creatures, they fell on their faces before the throne, worshiping God and saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation, for they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The ones who suffered, the ones who even died for the sake of the gospel, connected for eternity with that great multitude that no one could number from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing or falling down before the one who is worthy, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who also died for us. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I can't give you all the reasons why and what God has for you, but I can give you God's word and I can tell you God's in control. And I can remind you that God is good. And I can promise you that God has purpose. He does not waste our pain. And I can tell you this. Number one, God will use your pain to grow you into Christ-likeness so that, number two, you can be a better minister for him. And number three, so that you can be a greater part of advancing the kingdom that you, in ways that you could never do before. And so in the midst of suffering, we can say, God, I trust you. And in the midst of suffering, we can declare, and Lord, I believe in the end. When that day comes, when the elders fall, when crowns are cast, when glory is sang, when we see the Lamb, it'll all be worth it. This morning, would you just come to the altar? Can I invite you? God, I'm going through this. I don't like it. I don't understand it. But Lord, will you show me how you want to use it? I believe there are many in the room this morning that desperately need to offer up that prayer. I don't like it. I don't want it. But I trust you. Show me how you want to use it. I want to invite you to the altar this morning. For others, maybe you know someone who's hurting. You just need to go pray for that person. For others, you just need to cry out to God this morning because things are going just fine. And maybe your prayer needs to be something more along the lines of, God, just help me be faithful when my day comes too. However God's leading you, I invite you to come. Let's stand, let's worship this morning together. As we sing, let's uh, respond to the Spirit moving today.
from heaven's throne, you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you made. For all our sin and all our shame, you took the nails, you took our place. No one else could do what you have done. One name is higher. One name is strong. be exalted in our lives. Let me, you guys can remain standing. Just a couple of quick things for you this morning. First and, and foremost, Tim, listen, uh, the praise team, our worship leaders, they did an awesome job this past week. We are, first off, grateful for them. Are y'all grateful for our praise team? Awesome job. Really did. And I am so glad you are back, my brother. So there you go. Amen. I heard so many people talk about how much they missed you this week or this past month. And so if that was, if you were one of them, make sure you love on Tim and Trish. Let them know how much you missed them this past month while they were on sabbatical. How glad you are that they are, are to hear. Dang, I'm tongue tied now. How glad you are that they are back. Is that fair? Sounds good, I think. And so number two, next week is Jersey Sunday. So in case you missed the announcement, wear any jersey, any sport, even pickleball, right? You can wear your favorite team jersey. We want you uh, to come. And uh, as we wear our favorite team jersey on Super Bowl Sunday, we're reminded that in Christ we are one team and we have a mission that we're called to complete as well. So wear your favorite Super Bowl or uh, Super Bowl team jersey, Super Bowl Sunday next week. I promise I'll get it, Tim. And I didn't have this problem while you were gone. I don't know what happened. And <laughs> there we go. 
Um, also, right after uh, next Sunday, we do have a quick uh, business meeting. It is for two purposes. It's a special called business meeting, only these two purposes, so it will be quick. Number one is our personnel team has nominated um, uh, people in accordance with our Constitution and bylaws uh, to serve on our adult ministry pastor search team. I had somebody ask me uh, last week, so I'll clarify. That's not my position. Um, that's... That's another position that we have that works with our life groups and our adult ministry leaders. And um, Tyler, do we have those up on the sl- slide? Maybe. There we go. So we do have our adult ministry uh, pastor search team that you can see. Their names are up there. We also have a couple of spots from our nominating committee to make sure that our committees are at uh, full capacity. So deacon nominating committee, constitution and bylaws, missions committee, personnel committee. Those are some spots that we were just continuing to fill as we got into the new year. You can see those. Uh, We didn't get the email out last week. We will get an email out this week to our members. So be looking for that as well. And... um, Also, if you haven't done so yet, please, please, please register for Winter Bible Conference. It's coming up just a couple weeks away. It's going to be an awesome time for us to grow in Christ. We're going to talk about how we go better together, and uh, and you're not going to want to miss the amazing speakers, Daniel Henderson, Tara Dew, Jamie Dew, all throughout the week, tons of breakouts going on, fun uh, late night pizza night on Friday night. You're going to want to be a part of all of those things, so make sure you go to the app. If you don't have the app, it's hhbc.net uh, slash our app. Or you can go to hhbc.net slash events. events. Thank you so much, church family. Make sure you register for that. Other than that, y'all have a great week. Let's go make disciples this week, Highland Heights.